from Music for All and presented by Yamaha. It's teaching social-emotional learning through music, a practical web series for all music educators, embedding SEL into music education. On this episode, we welcome psychologist, educator, and songwriter, Dr. Don McManus. Please welcome our host of teaching social-emotional learning through music, Scott Edgar. Hi, everybody. Scott Edgar here. Thanks for joining for our next episode of Teaching Social and Emotional Learning Through Music. We've been speaking so powerfully about the mental health crisis that has been swirling as a result of the last two years. So on this episode, we are so fortunate to be joined by renowned child psychologist Don McManus, or as we've all come to know him, Dr. Mack. Dr. Mack, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Scott. It's my pleasure. What an honor. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey? So much of your work as a child psychologist, and I know exactly what you're doing in your own private practice, but you found a little bit of a niche here. You find a little bit of a niche about how you can use music in your practice. Can you tell us a little bit about what brought you to this space? Sure. Okay. So, you know, it's a confluence of different uh, events in my life. I think one one of the most important things was I was... um, I have been a child psychologist, as I said, and, and after about 15, 20 years, I started thinking, boy, I've, I've, I've been uh, listening to kids for years now and finding out what's going on in their little heads. I call it uh, a bird's eye view into their hearts and minds and that kind of thing. And um, so that was one thing. It's just like, you know, teaching developmental psychology, t- teaching cognitive psychology, um, and my one of my real passions is brain research and its applications to long-term relationships and getting along and all that stuff. So it was interesting. I've been into music all my life. So here I have the psychology and then the music came, came more and more into my head as, as like, boy, this is really what's needed in the world. I need a bigger microphone that I can deal with one-on-one teaching kids and families and, and that kind of thing. So I started writing a few songs and as luck would have it, I had a next door neighbor who knew, the, uh, the owner of the chipmunks, Alvin and the chipmunks. So that was one of my first forays into uh, a musical adventure with him. And then I met Christopher Cross. And for those of you who are old enough to know him, he was this guy who won like six Grammys in one night, you know, best artist, best song, best new artist, all that. And Christopher heard a couple of my songs and he said, wow, this is really a cool thing. And he had some kids and he says, I'll give you some free studio time. So I went in and I used his band and he played on a a number of my early songs and actually sang on a couple, some background vocals. And then as luck would have it, I I got in contact or or a guy contacted me who I used to sing with at Dartmouth College where I went to school. And he said, let's develop a, a TV show together. So we pitched the TV show here, there and everywhere, Disney and all that stuff. And, and I got feedback from one one group and they said, you know, we don't like your concept so much about your show, but we love your songs. Would you be music director and, and a songwriter of uh, JJ the Jet Plane, which was on a learning channel, then it got picked up by PBS for years. So that was about 20 years ago that JJ was in its heyday, so to speak. And um, so that was it, you know, and in, the, in the meantime, I'm saying to myself, boy, I really would like to make an impact, a bigger impact than I can make in my little office and, and put music out there and, uh, and do it, do something that's really different from what's, what's uh, there, uh, there, you know, now. And you, you've done that so brilliantly, you know, I think so many of the people watching and listening now are saying that that was him. And, and, and while that was him, and while that was him, there, there are so many things that have just pervaded popular culture. And now the thing that I was just so excited when our paths crossed was Happy Kids Songs. Can you tell us a little bit about Happy Kids Songs? Yeah, well, this this became my my passion. And what what happened to me is I would start to hear music in my head, you know, almost in the, in the middle of the night, taking a shower, you know, walks in the woods, that kind of thing. And I started to hear songs and, and they weren't completely formed any, any more than, uh, you know, the Beatles or anybody. It's interesting to watch the songwriting process of different masters at this, but I would get little hooks and little ideas. And so I'd be seeing a kid and then I would say, Oh gosh, there needs to be a song about this and that. And I, I started polling parents and families and, and kids and just, you know, 
what do you what do you want to listen to? And so, you know, that confluence of wow, there's a gap in terms of I used to call it the gap between Raffi and rap and Raffi is not so big anymore, but kind of like, you know, kids are in that sing songy age, you know, three, four years old or two. And Raffi's great for that. But then, then they're into rap music and oh my gosh, we, you know, we, how can we get, get music that's really uh, high quality, adult quality, um, highly entertaining, but can also boost social and emotional skills. Um, so it was kind of filling the gap between rap, Raffi and rap. And what we, what we learned very quickly, what I learned was that kids really like to listen to other kids sing. Number one, they don't like to just listen to, you know, one, one person sing. So having a variety of different kinds of songs and different, you know, different, uh, modes of music, different styles, uh, hearing other kids sing a variety of adult vocalists and, and a full production sound, you know, let's not kid, give kids music. Uh, give kids music that's kids music, you know, let, let's have it be adult quality, uh, you know, because that's that's what they deserve kind of thing. So I put all that together and it's, it's kind of like, OK, so here we've got, you know, tons of different themes and, and uh, ideas and putting it all together in the music. Well, I think we have a video that we're going to be able to show our audience in a way that's going to really help everyone visualize exactly what this is. <laughs> I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't. A great example of what we're talking about right now. So can you talk to us a little bit about why music? You know, there, there's so many different modalities and entry points that we could say we want to work on social and emotional skills with our students yeah. and, and different ways to do this. Why was music the answer for you? 
Well, it's, 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 you know, this is, this is my research. I'll put my research hat on to answer this question. And that is, you know, it's really almost a magical medium for, for helping kids learn, uh, retain information you know because because once something's in a song form you remember it in a way that's really different because it gets into different areas of the brain so music itself i mean anthropologists will tell you that music is like the oldest oldest thing that they can figure out about every culture had it in different forms and it isn't necessary for human survival but something inside us craves it uh music releases endorphins and you can feel happy and energized and, it lights up areas of the brain that are same as sex and drugs, believe it or not, or food and sex, you know. It also activates the different centers of the brain uh, in language and hearing and rhythmic motor control. And some researchers are saying, well, gosh, there's like 12 areas of the brain that get, get uh, that light up when, when music is being played. Uh, so it really helps change people's emotions. We know that when people are playing music together, there's a way that their brains sort of sync up. Uh, when people are singing, their breath sort of syncs up and when they're breathing and that kind of thing. So it really helps to um, create cooperation and, a, and a sort of a creative mood with people. So, um, you know, it's it's like it's the perfect medium, I think, to help help people learn stuff. The, one of the things that many of us say is it's kind of like, OK, so if you're if you're filing uh, some files and you're thinking about the ABCs and oh, does this go ahead? people think about that ABC song, right? It's just like it just pops into your head. And so the fact that uh, music stores information in so many areas of the brain makes it such a powerful tool for learning. A hundred percent. I still remember I learned my multiplication tables using a tune and, and that got me through third grade math. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know what it's done since. Uh, actually, no, it's given me a career that I uh, I adore. M my question then is, you know, we, we talk about meaningful connections that music helps us tap into spots of our, our brain, but I also believe parts of our heart, parts of our soul. So how have you found music being a unique modality to help uh draw out, serve as a starting point, a talking point for emotions with our youngest of students? So, it, you know, happy kids learn better. So if they're, if, if you're teaching social and emotional skills, it's just, it's just so important, uh, you know, to teach them these kinds of skills. And I, I like to use the analogy of computer, computer memory. When children are preoccupied, they don't have as much memory or attention available for learning. Like uh, uh, imagine a kid who's out in the playground and he's been teased or bullied or something. And all of a sudden he's supposed to go back in the classroom and learn what the teacher's teaching on the whiteboard or the blackboard or whatever they're using. It's forget it. Their, their brains are offline. So, you know, songs can, can teach this stuff uh, so magically as, as far as I'm concerned. And that's what, that's what our research showed when we, um, introduce songs and activities into the public schools here in Santa Barbara. Stunning. Um, I, another study that's coming to my mind is uh, some work about the power of music during the pandemic for adults, uh, that it has been just a powerful use uh, for us to be able to work through what people are calling the COVID blues. Uh, yeah. we, we've seen so many things come out just in the last month about a mental health crisis for youth it came out from exactly. the Surgeon General of the United States. Can you talk to us a little bit um, about what you're seeing with youth with regards to how uh, our youngest folks are responding to a lot of the challenges they've had over the last two years? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, well, what we're seeing nationwide and also in my own practice is about, about the same thing is this way, way more uh, kids with, with challenges, with anxiety, um, lack of socialization. They're afraid to go to school. What's interesting about anxiety is it can, it can generalize very easily. I can be upset about one thing, but not necessarily be aware that I'm upset about that thing, like COVID, right? And then it comes out in a different way. I just got a call this morning from a mom whose six and nine-year-old kids are you know, at each other's throats, you know, and, and so what are you going to do about that? Well, I can teach them skills and tools and the stuff that we've developed about how to talk things out. But oh my gosh, why not give them a song that sort of grounds that concept at the same time as teaching teaching what I'm, I'm trying to teach. But back to your question, um, 
years ago, I would say 10, 15 years ago, my practice was more filled with kids who were somewhat out of control, parents not giving the kids enough caring limits. You know, it's kind of like, well, I, well, I was treated too strict, so I'm going to compensate and not give my kids enough limits. And so that's a big mistake. What we figured out when my wife and I uh, did a lot of research on families and healthy families and that kind of thing. Uh, so it used to be that kids with behavioral challenges was more, you know, what I would get because I get a ton of referrals from local pediatricians. And now it's come to anxiety. Oh my gosh, it's probably a two to one ratio of kids with anxiety, separation anxiety, uh, getting dropped off at school. Um, you know, part of that is when we wear masks, we're not capable or as capable of reading facial expressions that give us information about how people are responding to what it is that we're saying or doing. And so these feedback loops that, that have been part of uh, how we've been socialized for years and years are absent. So anyway, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's what I would say about that. Absolutely, Dr. Mack. You know, I, I think there's so many things that are just swirling in the vernacular right now for, for our teachers, for our parents. Can you give us a working definition of anxiety? Because I think we hear so many people just say anxiety is at an all time high. Well, what does that mean? And how you know, you've given us some tangible examples, but I think just having something in our head that a unifying space to talk about this would really help giving us some language. Sure. Well, generalized anxiety, uh, which is which is probably the most common sort of form of anxiety with, with kids, especially, is is something where there's a feeling inside. It's almost like we, we've got this part of our brain called the amygdala, and the amygdala is like a fear center, and it's also like an alarm bell. And that alarm bell, if there's stress in the family or in the culture or in school or if you've been bullied or whatever it is, then what happens is this amygdala lights up. And it, and it almost starts to search the world for danger. It's kind of like, it's kind of like, oh my gosh, what, what can happen next? And you're sort of hypervigilant and you're looking. So that's what's going on. And sometimes that will crystallize or get formed into a specific anxiety about, you know, spiders or about going to school or about whatever. So it's fascinating, but the, the research on families shows that we are part of a system we are part of a collective. And so anxiety is something that gets flashed around. We have mirror neurons in our brain. And so what happens is that little kids, especially if they're highly sensitive, will pick up other people's stress and they will be manifesting the symptoms of the fact that mom is drinking too much or dad is stressed out or whatever. So anxiety is something that, that can form in a child or happen with a kid. Uh, but it can really be just a manifestation or a symptom of what's going on in the bigger picture. And, and this is just setting off a lot of connections for me about the discussion in education circles around trauma-informed practices. How can we as teachers be aware of trauma in many different manifestations at home and be uh, empathetic and making sure that we are not unintentionally triggering students. Can you talk a little bit about that intersection between anxiety and trauma? Well, anxiety is, a, is basically a symptom of trauma. So when we've had a trauma, that's what happens is the amygdala will light up and then you've got to shut it off. And how do you shut it off? Well, there's lots of ways. There's ways in terms of how it is that people handle their feelings and how they're able to express feelings. We know that the amygdala settles down when we feel understood. One of the songs that I have is called Talk It Out. And basically it's a template for, hey, it's a cool thing to be able to sit down with somebody and talk out your feelings. So one of the forms of expression that really helps that amygdala settle down, the amygdala actually settles down when we feel understood. That's what the brain research shows. And that's just a fascinating thing. If, if you or I are upset with somebody and we're able to in, express ourselves in constructive ways and feel understood by that person, guess what? We feel better about ourselves. We feel better about the other person. We feel better about the relationship. So that whole idea that uh, feelings want to come out is... Yeah, we can do that in the inter interpersonal way about how we talk stuff out. There's also ways that we can express our big feelings on our own, primarily through exercise and some other sort of tricks and tools that we've, we've developed. 
So that's one form of what fuels anxiety. The other one is our thoughts. And that's what the, you know, when you guys saw that, when we saw the shake it out uh, and dance uh, video, that's what that's about. And that is that we are sometimes fueling our anxiety with our negative thinking patterns. And if that's the case, well, then there's tools for how it is that we can create more positive thinking and how we can think ourselves into, into feeling better about situations. So some kids have the feelings part as a con contribution to anxiety. Some have the whole thing about their negative thinking patterns. And most people have both. So it's kind of like we want to attend all these different facets of what can can fuel or maintain anxiety over a long time. And, and, and I appreciate you going into that next direction because I know many <clears throat> parents and teachers are concerned about the long-term ramifications of the last two years. Oh um, yeah. What are your thoughts about what journey we are on from a mental, social, and emotional path moving forward with understanding what we've been through? I'm not sure what you mean, what journey we're on. We are headed into a, a space where I think there's been question about missed milestones, developmental loss. Being oh, yeah. Out of space. So, so I, I'll use the word recovery, but as we're starting to move through the physical crisis and we're getting back to experiences of in-person learning for our teachers, what's going to be the residue of the last two years? And, and what is the concern from a perspective of a child psychologist about what this is going to look like moving forward? That's a great question, and 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 I don't I don't know the answer to that. I could I could make some guesses, and that is that kids will be under socialized. They'll be they'll be behind be behind cognitively. There'll be large discrepancies between kids who have the um, the wealth or the means to be educated sufficiently at home. I've got one family that I'm treating right now, and they happen to be fairly wealthy. And they're homeschooling the kids through this whole, you know, pandemic. And boy, those kids are probably going to, you know, do fairly well compared to other kids, peers across the country who don't have the, the luxury of having somebody there teaching them all the time when they have to be, you know, the, the, the Zooming really, really needs to be supplemented by other, by other forms of education and experience with kids. Uh, the social thing is, oh my gosh, there's, there's kids for, who for two years haven't had the ability to play with other kids. And what we know, there's an interesting, uh, some interesting research about what happens. What is, what's one of the highest predictors of mental health at age 16? And I'll tell you what it is. It's having connections in third grade with other kids. And that's a higher predictor of mental health at age 16 than any psychological tests that we have. Just feeling like there are other kids who care about you and you're connected to, it's not about being the most popular kid in the class. It's about being and feeling like other kids are there for you. They've got your back. And, and kids like to go to school, quite honestly, not because they wanna learn or because they wanna see their teachers. The most important reason why they wanna to go to school is to hang out with their friends. Right. And it's not just kids with problems that say, you know, what's your favorite part of school? Well, I like this, that, and the other thing, but I like recess, you know, and that's where it's kind of like the wild, the wilds come out and the kids have the ability to just kind of run around and scream and, and play with each other. And the fact that that's not happening, I'm sure is having long-term effects on kids, social development, their cognitive development. Um, and and we don't know what you know this is like a huge social experiment that we haven't been through so this there's research that's starting to come out but we don't really know all the answers yet about that and, and i appreciate the honesty there it's you know we're all on this journey together we're finding our way through the woods and uh we're in this together the the two most powerful words that you've said in your last two brilliant responses were connection and understanding you know when a when a child is understood they're able to flourish. And to me, uh, just starting to draw some explicit connections to SEL language, to me, that's agency. When the teacher's able to say, I understand you, how do you work in this environment? That agency right. is just such a critical space. And this connection, this sense of belonging and relationships together. You know, I, I think in the music education world, you know, <clears throat> 
our music teachers were hitting it out of the park during remote learning. You know, they, they were doing everything they could, but the piece that they couldn't replicate is group music making together. Oh, and yeah. that's, that's the joy that we're seeing right now, Dr. Mack, in the profession is that our, our teachers are bringing people back together in community. Yes, in masks and yes, with everything else to keep us physically safe. Yeah. But it is just one of those things that you can't replicate through a computer. Yeah, yeah. Well, Zoom is two dimensional instead of three dimensional. And then you're, you're missing that most important thing, which is how when we are cl close to each other, and this is the research on mirror neurons, there are ways that our emotions are feeding and fueling other people's brains. And that's a fascinating concept, but it can't happen through Zoom. And I don't know if you've tried, but so just, just even try having three people sing happy birthday on Zoom and it comes out all crazy because <laughs> it's completely not synced. So unfortunately, as good as Zoom may have been for the music teachers, it's like, you know, getting people to kind of play together or sing together, forget it, it doesn't work. This audience is saying, preach, yes, 100%. Right. Uh, the, and I don't know about you, but in my family, even if we're in person, we're not singing it together. So uh, so we have a journey there too, whether we're in person or over Zoom. So yeah. Dr. Yeah. Dr. Mack, you know, w when you're talking about your practice or you're working with this family or the work that you're doing that has just such a wide reach, in my mind, I'm hearing engagement in the music classroom. I'm hearing a lot of these techniques and a lot of these things that our music teachers can do. So yeah. from your perspective, understanding that we don't know what the end is going to look like or the next few years are going to look like in terms of development, what are some priorities that you would say our music teachers need to amplify in their space to help our students navigate all of this? Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things I, I hadn't mentioned, but, you know, one of the things that I've been involved with in the last few years is, you know, after writing about 50 songs and putting them up there on, online, is um, I was inspired to write a musical. It's called Elementary School Musical, and it's really tailor-made for sixth grade performances or you know, even eighth grade performances for kids and that kind of thing. Um, and it's fabulous because it's it's got you know it's threaded with with these various songs that I've written. It's it's a combination of music is, and messages and performance all rolled in one because that's what theater does. Um, so one of the things is that that teachers or, or music teachers could use either the whole play because it's about an hour long and can be supplemented. There are tracks and, and I have uh, some of my favorite Santa Barbara superstars singing the songs now. But I've got the tracks that are separate from that, and that can be played and then it can be you know, sung to karaoke-like. So one of the suggestions I, I might make is for people to look into that, elementaryschoolmusical.com, or it's actually elementarymusical.com, um, and to use either parts of the play or the whole play, and you can play along. You can add piano or drum or guitar or you know, trumpets or whatever, and and sort of, you know, use that as a as a vehicle for, you know, both entertainment, which is the number one thing. But then you add on to that, what can people learn? What can kids learn along the way that can be really helpful and important to them? Um, there's a song called Talk It Out. And that song is specifically about, you know, the what we call the repair kit, which is the same as... Uh, you know, there's other forms of this kind of thing where kids can sit down and talk their feelings out rather than than uh, act them out or withdraw from each other or I'm not going to play with you anymore or I don't like you. And it's just like, well, how do they deal with feelings and be able to sit down and talk them out? Um, there's a couple of bullying songs that I have that are national hits because bullying is still a big deal. I mean, we talked about anxiety before. One of the one of the things that happens when people are anxious is they start to act out with other people. You know, it's kind of like, I'm not even aware that I'm anxious, but I'm, I know that I'm angry and I'm whatever. And so, you know, feelings are pretty diffuse and they can get centered on, on, uh, you know, a kid that you want to pick on, but you're really upset because your parents are fighting that morning or because you were bullied or whatever. So that's the kind of thing that can be really helpful. I think to, to music teachers, maybe just to play that song. These songs can be played at the beginning or the end of a, of a music session, or the kids can learn the song specifically. Um, I would say that the other thing is, is any of the CBT songs, 
I call it CBT, it's called cognitive behavior therapy. And that goes back to what I was saying before about what's what, what are the thoughts in our head that will give us problems? What are the things that we're saying to ourselves in a negative nature that's problematic? And uh, we call that cognitive behavioral therapy. And what I've done is, is I've written a few songs about that same topic for different kids at different age ranges, sort of in the four to nine or three to nine age range. Um, and these songs basically give, they provide the template for how it is that kids can learn about, you know, I have socks, but I am not my socks. I have a football in my hand, but I'm not my football. I have my clothes, and but I am not, I am not my thoughts and I can become the boss of my thoughts. And that is so empowering to kids. And it's the kind of thing that I say, I and mean, I'm gonna tell you a little secret. And I say this to moms and dads. So I say like most people on the planet do not know that they can become the boss of their thoughts. That if a thought pops in their head, it's not necessarily significant. It can be a helpful fear as an example. It could be a fear of if I'm crossing the street, well, I should darn well look, you know, look both ways. That's a helpful fear. But a fear of spiders when I hardly ever see them or a fear of, you know, social interactions when I actually get to school and I'm playing fine and I'm everything's fine as I'm in school. But why am I yelling and screaming for 15 minutes, you know, as I'm trying to get out of the car or dragged out of the car to go into school. So teaching kids these tools, teaching adults these tools, I find that you know, I've got this secret agenda was, is, is that I'm not just wanting to teach kids about this stuff. I want to make the music as entertaining as possible and as full production as possible so that teachers and parents enjoy it too. And I hear all this feedback at times from people emailing me and saying, yeah, I, I dropped the kids off at school and I'm still listening to your, your music and singing at the top of my voice on the way home kind of thing. So that's the kind of stuff that kind of floats my boat and makes me feel like I'm, I'm at least marginally successful so far at helping the world uh, change and, and for people to learn these tools that I know, but are, uh, haven't been really shared that well, I think, in, in the broader picture of things. Well, I, I know that everyone watching and listening is like, okay, so this is coming into my classroom because it, it sounds really powerful. Now, one thing that popped into my head is you know, I am a music educator. I am not a psychologist. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a counselor. I think there's a concern when we start to have words such as CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, and what that looks like. What is that line from what your perspective is for how teachers can engage in some of these discussions and some of these entry points that your music affords without crossing into that therapeutic relationship? Wow, that's a good question. And, it's, and it's, I'm probably not the best person to answer that because, um, you know, with, with teachers, the, what, what I've found over the years is that teachers in general, this is what they're dealing with. They're not dealing with academic challenges so much as social and emotional challenges. So, you know, I, I, I think it's really up to the parent or the teacher to decide what do I feel comfortable with? And one of my uh, one of my favorite things to say to folks, whether they're teachers or parents, that I you know I, I, I do a lot of school consultation still, is try not to be so much of a teacher but a teaching. Be what it is that you want the kids to learn, and they're going to model model it after you. They're going to steal it from you. You you become a happy person with certain ideas. And they're going to want to steal that from you. You know, you don't have to teach it. You don't have to ram stuff or information down people's throats. That's, that's certainly not the way to go. So one is simply to be a model for all this stuff. And then the second one is to approach it gradually. In other words, you know, you can play a song and, and, and uh, play it a bunch of times and kids might hear it and they start to get interested. And so what is that, you know, what is this about, you know, and what, what's the song about? And so, you're not pushing it. You're simply just exposing kids to it and seeing how they respond and then take it from there because every person's different. But what I find um, in my teacher training classes is that it's, it's so important for us to focus on what it is, where are we at with our own social and emotional learning and be a model for that. And I think the research on, on SEL 
says the same thing, which is you just can't go and teach teachers how to teach this stuff, whether they're music teachers or academic, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, it's, it's, it's so important for them to, to be a teaching. Such a, a powerful statement with modeling and a, a really good uh, segue into my next question. I know that children are your primary audience, but we are seeing so many teachers right now having to climb that mountain or are just burned out from everything that's swirling on in their lives. If you had some words to our teachers who might be navigating some of these challenges, what would those be? Well, first of all, that to normalize the situation, because everybody's going through this. I mean, it's just all the caregivers and teachers. I mean, there's there's stress reduction tools, there's mindfulness, there are ways to, to breathe through stress, uh, which are really good. They're very helpful, but they're often insufficient. And one of the most important things that I've done in the last couple of years is, is um, collaborated with a guy who's a psychiatrist at Harvard Medical School who wrote a book about exercise. And I'm telling everybody that possibly can to do aerobic exercise. And as you're doing it, it's fabulous. I mean, it, it, once again, bes besides music, it's another thing that increases endorphins and every one of the major neurotransmitters, you know, dopamine, norepinephrine, norepinephrine, serotonin, these are important things that if we get exercise on a daily basis or, or, or even just a few times a week and get our hearts going into that aerobic zone, there's a fabulous uh, amount of healing in terms of stress that takes place with that. And then add on to that, you can couple that with expressing in your mind some of your frustrations, some of the things that you don't like. And the purpose of this is to let those emotions go. And we know that when you're exercising and you're able to think about stuff as you're moving major muscle groups and, and what we call sub-vocalizing, you're, you're screaming in your mind like, I hate this. I have so many people I've taught how to scream at COVID, right? It's kind of like, there's this enemy that's about to attack us. And what do we do? Well, we've got all this adrenaline and cortisol that's built up because we want to fight this COVID enemy, but it, you know, we can't put on our armor and go and, and, and attack the enemy over the hill. We've got to just kind of live with it and avoid people, which is like so counterintuitive and so not, not productive. So exercise is really at, you know, at the top of my list of things that I recommend to folks as a way of dealing with stress and, and sort of couple that with that emotional expression piece. And the purpose of the getting into the feelings is to get out of them. That's, that seems like a paradox, but in order to be able to let go of feelings, we want to express them in a constructive way. We want to go into them as much as we can so that we can get out of them and then be happy for the rest of our day kind of thing and have positive thinking going on. I love that. I, I've been watching something that's gone viral on social media the last few days, and it was this high school that had parents have the ability to go to this middle of this football field and just scream and, and yeah. just provide a space to just yell. So when you yes. said that that's something that you get that, I, I was thinking, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, I, and at the beginning of the pandemic, I wrote a song. It took a few months to put the whole thing together. You can't just write a song like people from all over the country singing on it. Um, but, you know, there's a, there's a section in it where it's like, I just want to scream and I don't want to be in Zoom in my room anymore. And it's like, you know, so we're all sort of suffering and from the same kind of stuff. And so just giving people tools to express, like we said, you know, screaming is a good thing. And it's, you know what, it's interesting because swearing is a really good thing too, but we don't want to swear at people or around people but if I'm really mad about something and I want to let it go and I'm just like, you know, swearing in my head can be this research that shows that swearing helps as a form of, of releasing feelings. So go for it, you know, just let it, let it be. And I, I've even been teaching this lately to uh, a couple of local pastors of churches, you know, and it's kind of like, oh my gosh, is this Christian or not? Oh, like, is it okay to feel angry? Well, yeah, it really is okay. That's part of our humanness. It's really part of who we are as human beings or even as mammals are naturally expressive all the time. You go into the jungle and you hear monkeys, you know, screaming and crying and, you know, and, and making all these sounds. And so as, as mammals, we want to make sounds and that's a helpful thing to us. 
in a, and every emotion to me makes sense. You know, I, I think when we get in trouble, we say, oh, that, that's a bad emotion to feel or we shouldn't feel that emotion. Yeah. That that shuts off that part of our humanity and doesn't allow us to work through it. So 100%. It. Yeah. So I have one more question for you, and this is going to get a little bit more personal, thinking back to maybe one of the first few songs that you ever wrote, your songwriting <clears throat> journey. What has it meant to you to be able to create something musically and how does that relate to your identity and your growth because i know so many of our teachers are starting to engage our students in songwriting and it's just yeah. a big thing yeah. in music education so what has songwriting meant to you personally well a, a side note to all of what it, what i've heard about my the psychology part of me and the music part of me is my spiritual part and that is that I don't feel like I'm necessarily writing these songs. And that sounds weird, but the creative spark that starts out is something that's very spiritual to me. It's very important to me. It's kind of like, I've got this gift inside of me and I want to, I want to give it away. And that's how I've been guided in terms of my own spiritual path. Um, I wrote a song called the gift of giving and I, I had the thing completely sung by myself. And then I had this woman, Lois Mahalia, who's an African-American woman here in Santa Barbara, who's a superstar, who sings with my, you know, Joe Walsh and Michael McDonald and all these Kenny Loggins and all that stuff. And she started to sing the background vocals to this song. And I felt a tap on my shoulder and I looked around and I heard a voice and it's like, nobody's there, but I hear this voice says, give Lois the song, give her the song. And I'm starting this argument and I said, I just, God, I just paid a whole bunch of money to, to sing this myself and all this investment and time and whatever. I can't give her the song, give her the song. And I kept hearing this, whatever. And it's like, okay, so Don's crazy, whatever. So <laughs> I pulled Lois out and I said, Lois, this is what's going on. I'm going to be honest with you. And she, I said, would you be able, or would you want to sing the song? So we completely redid the song with Lois singing. It's called The Gift of Giving. And it's one of those things that I, I feel is one of my most important songs because it really exemplifies the research that shows that to the degree that we are capable of giving to others, you know what? We're just as much giving to ourselves. And that's a really good example of how it is that we are all so just completely interconnected with those around us. We are so amazingly intricately connected to people around us and so, it was the same sort of voice that, that uh, prompted me to give all my songs away now at happykidsongs.com is, wow, I just want to, you know, it's like I've been given this gift. It comes through me. Okay, so I'm just going to throw it out there and, and uh, give it to the world before I uh, retire and that kind of thing. Dr. Mack, so you know that we're going to send these links to everybody. So they're going to have resources and know where to go. So uh, the gift that you are giving through your time today and your resources are going to have a wide reach across all of music education. So for all of us, I'd like to say thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much. Dr. Mack, any parting words before we wrap this one up? Oh, wow. Yeah, I think it's just important. I mean, what, what this all comes down to is love and, and love is the substance that we're all living in. And, and for us to be able to love and support each other through these hard times, I think we're going to get out of this. And I've got a lot of hope. And I also have hope for the future um, of, of, of society, given that, yes, there's all this really great information that research has taught us. And now it's just a matter of how it is that we impart it. How do we get people in school? How do we teach it to teachers so that they can impart this information? And the same with parents and, and to, to help the next generation. And I feel hopeful about the next generation of kids coming up. I think they're just pretty extraordinary kinds of human beings that are going to help, help uh, in a number of ways, save the planet and, and uh, improve the world in, in ways that are more, uh, more loving and kind. Dr. Mack, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that, you know, as we work through the challenges, we will emerge stronger. And for me, whenever I go into a school or talk to a group of students, I agree the future is bright. Yeah, yeah. Great. From, from, from the bottom of my heart, Dr. Mack, on behalf of Music for All and all of the music teachers who are watching from across this country, thank you so much for the gift of your time today. Thank you. My pleasure. Yep. Bye-bye. 
Music for All's mission is to create, provide, and expand positively life-changing experiences through Music for All. Our vision is to be a catalyst to ensure that every child across America has access and opportunity to participate in active music making in their scholastic environment. I want to thank Dr. Mack for giving us the perspective of a child psychologist, but with the wisdom of music to help us navigate some of the challenges that we're all facing and the wisdom that he gave us as adults who are struggling with these same challenges. I'd like to thank our national presenting sponsor, the Yamaha Corporation of America. Be sure to check out the Yamaha Educator Suite at yamahaeducatorsuite.com. And I would also like to thank GIA Publications for their continued support. Before we say goodbye, we are extremely grateful for any donations gifted to our nonprofit organization. If you enjoyed this program, and in order for us to continue to provide our free educational resources and advocacy materials, please consider gifting to Music for All at any amount. Please visit musicforall.org. For Music for All, I'm Scott Edgar. Thank you. Music